I'd like to start today by just reviewing Hammurabi's empire that you read about last week. This is the map that we went over in class last week. And remember that Hammurabi started out as the king of a small kingdom named Babylon. To the north of him was the Assyrian Empire. Shamshi Adad had started out as the king of Mari and began to take over the little kingdoms around him until he had built an empire for himself. And Hammurabi made a treaty with Shamshi Adad, and Shamshi Adad helped him to take over the kingdoms that were south and west and east of him. As part of your homework, I asked you to transfer information from the large map we did in class to the smaller map on your homework. And so you should have transferred the location of the Assyrian Empire and the Babylonian Empire. And remember that once Shamshi Adad died and his children took over the Assyrian Empire, Hammurabi felt like he no longer needed to honor the treaty that he made with their father, and he moved north and took over Assyria also and made an empire that he called Babylonia. Not to be mixed up with the Babylon that later conquered Israel. Just a quick review of Hammurabi's code. Hopefully you saw that a lot of the issues that Hammurabi was dealing with in human behavior are similar to issues that we still have today. For example, many of his laws involved what to do about false accusations, what to do with people who steal, what to do with people who receive stolen property, issues about inheritance, issues about divorce, business contracts, what to do about property damage, how to handle money lending, dealing with kidnappers, <laughs> medical malpractice, building and housing construction, and making sure that the court system was just and fair, that people got honest and fair judgments from judges. Now all of these are things that we still have some kind of law on our books today. Probably not as severe as Hammurabi's laws, but still these things are, are dealt with in our law code because human nature hasn't changed. We still have people who falsely accuse others. We still have people who steal. There are still divorces. We still need to make sure that there isn't medical malpractice and we want honest judges in our court systems. Some of his laws cover issues that we generally don't have today. For example, there are laws about paying someone to go to war for you in your place. I know that in the United States that that was still a thing up through the Civil War where if you were drafted that you could pay somebody else to go in your place. Harboring escaped slaves. Once again, that was an issue up through the American Civil War, but since slavery is illegal in the United States now. I don't think if you were harboring an escaped slave today, anything would happen to you legally. Failing to pay for one's section of the levy. And this has to do with taxation. We may not force people to keep the road out in front of their house looking nice, but we have changed the way that we handle things like that. We tax people and then the government is expected to keep the road in front of our house looking nice. This next week you're going to be reading about Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh has both historical and legendary aspects to his kingship. We're going to go over first some of the historical aspects. The first thing I'd like to point out is that the name of Gilgamesh actually appears on the Sumerian kings list. The Sumerians kept a kings list and there are many kings on that list that we never question whether they were a real historical figure or not. 
Gilgamesh appears on this king's list. As archaeologists have done more research in the area of Uruk, they have found preserved bricks that have inscriptions saying that it was King Gilgamesh who built the walls of Uruk. Also, there are fragments of a historical text that tell about his death and his funeral. Archaeologists don't question the validity of the rest of the historical aspects of this particular fragment, but up until the early 2000s, they did question whether Gilgamesh was a real person. And the text that they found is actually a historical text. It tells other things, and then it launches into a discussion of King Gilgamesh, how he died, and how the people of Uruk chose to bury him. He's also listed as the son of Lugobanda, king of Uruk, and most archaeologists and historians believe that Lugobanda was an actual person, that he actually existed, that he was a king of Uruk. Now, granted, Gilgamesh also has some legendary features to his story. We're told that he is two-thirds god and one-third human, probably not historical. We're told that he's a tamer of animals, and in fact, in the picture you see there, he is holding a lion. And by tamer, when we think of someone who tames a wild animal, we think of someone who has hand-raised it, and it is an animal that you're able to feed, and it won't attack you, and you're able to groom it, or whatever else you need to do with this animal. There is that aspect of Gilgamesh, but there is also the aspect of him being a mighty hunter. To the Sumerians, taming an animal wasn't just making it domesticated, it may have also been killing it. We read that Inanna wanted to marry him. That's probably not a historical fact. And then also we're told that he talked to Utnapishtim about the Great Flood and about eternal life. Utnapishtim is the name of the Noah character in the Sumerian version of Flood Tales. One of the earliest stories that mentions Gilgamesh is the story of Inanna and the Hulapu tree, and I thought that we would take some time to read that together. So if you'll turn to that in your packet of homework assignments. And it begins, In the first days, in the very first days, in the first nights, in the very first nights, in the first years, in the very first years, in the first days when everything needed was brought into being, in the first days when everything needed was properly nourished, when bread was baked in the shrines of the land, and bread was tasted in the homes of the land, when heaven had moved away from earth, and earth had separated from heaven, and the name of man was fixed, when the sky god An had carried off the heavens, and the air god Enlil had carried off the earth, when the queen of the great below, Ereshkigal, was given the underworld for her domain. At that time it was planted a tree, a single tree, by the banks of the great river. Enki, the father, did plant the Hulubu tree, the god of wisdom. He planted it by the banks of the Euphrates. The tree was nurtured by the waters of the Euphrates. A young woman, who walked in fear of no man and who would not be owned, plucked the tree from the river and spoke. And before we read what she said, I am going to just pause here to remind you that Mesopotamia was a mud plain, and so there was a lot of flooding, a lot of mud, and because of that, it was not an ideal place for tree growing. One of the reasons that the Hanging Gardens of Babylon was built was because the king at the time had married a woman who had come from the mountains, and she was used to lush vegetation, and when she moved to Mesopotamia, she was disappointed in how barren it was there, and so her husband built her a mountain and filled it with vegetation for her. It was a, a lovely wedding present. And so a tree in Mesopotamia would have had to be nurtured and cared for. And so the young woman who walks in fear of no man and would not be owned, I think that's an interesting description of her, turns out to be the goddess Inanna. And she says, I shall bring the tree to Uruk. I shall plant this tree in my holy garden. Inanna cared for the tree with her hand. She settled the earth around the tree with her foot. She wondered, how long will it be until I have a shining throne to sit upon? How long will it be until I have a comfortable bed to lie upon? And just to pause there, remember that without trees, you don't have wood to make things like beds 
and make things like thrones and she's wanting to nurture this tree so that she can harvest it and she can make for herself a throne and a bed. The years passed, five years, then ten years. The tree grew thick, but its bark did not split. Then a serpent, who could not be charmed, made its nest in the roots of the Halapu tree. The Anzo bird set his young in the branches of the tree. And the dark maid Lilith built her home in the trunk. And I'd like to pause there. The serpent, as far as I've been able to research, was just a serpent. She tried to charm it to make it leave. It wasn't able to. But the Anzu bird is a mythological creature that turns up in a lot of Sumerian, Mesopotamian literature. We're going to be reading a story about the Anzu bird this week, and then we're also going to be reading a story about the Anzu bird next week. Now Lilith, you might recognize her name. She turns up later on in Hebrew literature also. Her name literally means night hag. <laughs> I think that's a horrible name, but that's her name. And she was considered to be a female demon. And so having these three creatures take their home in this tree that she's been nurturing and she has plans for, the young woman who loved to laugh wept. How Inanna wept. Yet they would not leave her tree. As the bird began to sing, at the coming of the dawn, the sun god Utu left his royal bedchamber. Inanna called to her brother Utu, saying, O oh, Utu, in the days when the fates were decreed, when abundance overflowed in the land, when the domains of the great gods were divided, and Enki did quest for the underworld, then did I pluck the Halapu tree from the Euphrates, then did I plant it in my holy garden, and tend it, waiting for my shining throne and comfortable bed. Then a serpent nested in the roots and could not be charmed, and the Anzu bird set his young in the branches, and the dark maid Lilith built her home in the trunk. I wept, how I wept. Yes, they would not leave my tree. Utu, the valiant warrior, Utu, would not help his sister Inanna. And I'm amused by that. I'm going to stop there to say that Utu was actually Inanna's twin brother, and so he wasn't just a brother, he was her twin brother, so you would have thought that they would have had a very close, strong relationship. She asks him for help, she has this big long speech asking him for help, and he doesn't help her. Next she's going to ask Gilgamesh for help, and I'd like to say before we read it that he's called her brother here, and as far as I can tell, Gilgamesh was never considered to be Inanna's brother, that this is more of a, an honorific title. He is the king of Uruk, she is the patron goddess of Uruk, and so she calls him her brother. As the birds began to sing at the coming of the second dawn, Inanna called to her brother Gilgamesh, saying, O oh Gilgamesh, in the days when the fates were decreed, when abundance overflowed in the land, when the domains of the great gods were divided, then did I pluck the hulubu tree from the Euphrates. Then did I plant it in my holy garden and tend it, waiting for my shining throne and comfortable bed. Then a serpent nested in the roots and could not be charmed. The Anzo bird set his young in the branches, and the dark maid Lilith built her home in the trunk. I wept, how I wept, yet they would not leave my tree. Gilgamesh, the valiant warrior, Gilgamesh, the hero of Uruk, stood by Inanna. Gilgamesh fastened his armor of fifty minas around his chest. The fifty minas weighed as little to him as fifty feathers. He lifted his bronze axe, the axe of the road, weighing seven talents and seven minas to his shoulder. Minas and talents were weights, and I'm not 100% sure how much a mina would have weighed, but According to the research that I did, a talent was said to have weighed as much as an adult would have weighed. And so him carrying around an axe that weighed seven talents plus seven minas, he's, they're depicting him as a very strong warrior. And so he entered Inanna's holy garden. Gilgamesh struck the serpent who could not be charmed. So he takes his axe and he starts chopping up the roots and he ends up killing the serpent. And then it says the Anzu bird flew with his young to the mountains, and Lilith smashed her home and fled to the wild, uninhabited places. And so they're just going to run away. They don't want to get hit by the axe also, like the serpent was. 
Gilgamesh then loosened the roots of the halapu tree, and the sons of the city who accompanied him cut off the branches. From the trunk of the tree, he, that is Gilgamesh, carved a throne for his holy sister, and from the trunk of the tree, Gilgamesh carved a comfortable bed for Inanna. From the roots of the tree, she fashioned a puku for her brother, so she's going to give him a gift also. He used the trunk to build her what she wanted. She's using the roots to fashion a puku, and then it says from the crown of the tree, in other words, from the branches of the tree, she fashioned a miku for Gilgamesh, the hero of Uruk, and so she rewards him for helping her. Now, historians aren't sure exactly what a puku and a miku are, but because of some other places where it turns up in Mesopotamian literature, they are pretty sure that the puku and the miku were a kind of game, that they were made out of wood, obviously she makes them out of wood, and that the puku was round, probably a very heavy round wooden ball, and they assume that the miku would have been like a mallet or a bat that you would hit the puku with, so that it was a game that was similar to polo. Flipping back to the beginning of the story, I do want to point out that we have instances of both parallelism and repetition. So here we have an instance of parallelism right at the beginning. I'm going to underline that in red. In the first days, in the very first days, in the first nights, in the very first nights, in the first years, in the very first years. And it goes on from there. When bread was baked in the shrines of the land, and bread was tasted in the homes of the land, that's parallelism. When heaven had moved away from earth, and earth had separated from heaven, parallelism. How long will it be until I have a shining throne to sit upon? How long will it be until I have a comfortable bed to lie upon? parallelism. We also have, as I said, instances of repetition. Inanna, in one instance, is talking to her brother, her twin brother, Utu, and when she talks to Gilgamesh, she says the exact same thing. I'd like to talk just a little bit about Gilgamesh's father, Lugalbanda. He was a historical king of Uruk, but he also had some legendary features. We're going to discuss the historical features first. Like Gilgamesh, Lugobanda appears on the Sumerian kings list. He's listed as a shepherd king in other places. And remember, the ideal of the shepherd king was the valiant warrior, but also the intercessor with the gods. And in fact, in many of his stories, he's called Holy Lugobanda. He appears in royal hymns from the time that ur -Namu and his son Shulgi were kings, and they describe Lugalbanda as their holy father. But he also has some legendary aspects to his kingship. He's the hero of two Sumerian stories. One is Lugalbanda and the Mountain Cave, and we're going to read that together in just a moment. And then also Lugalbanda and the Anzu Bird. He was considered to be the consort of the goddess Ninsun, and consort is kind of an honorific title for the husband or the wife of someone who is much more important than them. Prince Philip of England was considered to be the consort of Queen Elizabeth. He was her husband, he was a prince, but he had the honorific title of consort. And Lugobanda was later worshipped as a god himself. We're going to talk a little bit about Lugobanda in the mountain cave. But first, I want to mention the kingdom of Arata. The kingdom of Arata was a legendary kingdom that is mentioned in many Sumerian stories. However, archaeologists aren't quite sure where it is. According to Sumerian legend, it is a fabulously wealthy place full of gold, silver, lapis lazuli, which is a semi precious stone and other precious materials, as well as the artisans to craft those things. It's also a remote and difficult place to reach. In fact, the stories say that you have to walk through seven mountains in order to get to Arata. And it is the home of the goddess Inanna, who ends up transferring her allegiance from Arata to the city of Uruk. 
I do want to mention that there's a group of archaeologists that just in the past few years have uncovered a city in Ukraine, and some of the, them believe that it is the legendary city of Arata. The first story that I would like to discuss that features the city of Arata is En Merker and the Lord of Arata. Now, En Merker was the first king of the first dynasty of Uruk. And in the story, he attempts to lure Inanna to his kingdom by promising to build her a temple. At Inanna's advice, he demands that Ensu Keshdana, the king of Arata, submit to him and send him building materials to complete the temple. So he's adding insult to injury there. Inanna ends up leaving Arata and transferring her allegiance to Uruk. And Ensu Keshdana challenges King and Marker to send a champion to Arata to fight for which city deserves Inanna's presence and her allegiance. And so this was actually a common way of settling disputes in ancient days. We see that with David and Goliath, that the two armies are confronting one another and Goliath comes forth as a champion and asks them to send out a champion and, and we'll see who really should win this battle. Of course, what ends up happening is that Uruk's champion wins, and Arata has to submit to Uruk and send these building materials to finish Inanna's temple. And in fact, a temple for Inanna was built in Uruk. They called it the House of Heavens. And here's a picture of one section of the interior of that temple and another picture of one section of the exterior of that temple. The next story that I would like to discuss that features the city of Arata is Enmerker and Ensukeshdana. And in that story, Ensukeshdana challenges Enmerker of Uruk to submit to him over the affections of Inanna. He wants to bring the goddess back to Arata. Enmerker ignores the challenge. And then a sorcerer arrives in the city of Arata, and he offers to make Uruk submit to Arata. The sorcerer travels to the city of Aresh, where he bewitches and murkers livestock. But a wise woman outperforms his magic, and she casts him into the Euphrates. So then Arata has to admit the loss of Inanna, and they submit to Uruk. In the story of Lugal Banda and the Mountain Cave... Arata rebels against the rule of Enmerker and the city of Uruk. So King Enmerker travels with his army through the mountains to wage war against the rebellious city of Arata. Along the way, Lugalbanda falls ill and becomes too sick to march with the army of Uruk, and he's left in a cave with provisions, and they hope that he recovers and makes his way back to Uruk. While he is in the cave, Lugobanda prays to various gods and he ends up recovering, but then he's out in the mountains and he does not want to go back to Uruk. He wants to catch up with the army. And so we're kind of left with a cliffhanger. We don't know what happens if this was the only story we got to read about him. Fortunately, we have another story to read about Lugobanda. That is Lugobanda and the Anzu bird. It picks up where the other story leaves off. Lugalbanda befriends the Anzu bird, and he asks it to help him find his army again. When Enmerker's army is faced with a setback, Lugalbanda volunteers to return to Uruk to ask the goddess Inanna for some aid. He travels quickly through the mountains, and soon he arrives back in the city of Uruk, where Inanna he finds lounging in her brand new temple, waiting for the offerings to be brought to her. And rather than come back with him, Inanna gives Lugobanda instructions about how Enmerker can win the battle against Nerata, and in fact, he does. And this story ends with a praise to Lugobanda. Woo-hoo-hoo! -hoo, yay! We're going to go ahead and read Lugobanda and the Mountain Cave together. I do want to remind you that even though we are reading this story together, it is part of your pre-reading activities, and there's an assignment for you to go back through this and mark where you find parallelism and repetition. So please don't skip that thinking, oh, we already did this part of the assignment because we're not finishing that assignment. You need to finish that at home. And the story goes, when in ancient days boundaries were laid out and borders were fixed, 
when boundary stones were placed and inscribed with names, when dikes and canals were purified, when the scepter and the staff of the city of Uruk were held high in battle. Now at that time the king and Merkur set his mace toward the city of Arata. He was going to set off to destroy that rebel land. And so saying that he set his mace toward the city means that he's bringing his, a, a mace was a, a weapon, and so he's going there to wage war against the city. Their king went to the head of the army, and Merkur went to the head. Five days passed. On the sixth day, they bathed. On the seventh day, they entered the mountains. At that time, there were seven. There were seven. The young ones born in a rook, there were seven. They were heroes living in Sumer. They were princely in their prime. They had been brought up eating at the god Anu's table. These seven were the overseers, were the captains, were the generals. They stood at the service of Enmerker as his elite troops. I want to point out the repetition there. There were seven, there were seven, and that they were young. Lugobanda was the eighth of the young champions of Enmerker's army. In fact, Lugobanda's name literally means young king. When they had covered half the way, covered half the way, a sickness befell him there. A head sickness befell him. He jerked like a stake, dragged by its head with a reed. His mouth bit the dust like a gazelle, caught in a snare. No longer could his hands return the hand grip. I think it's interesting that they used to shake hands back then also. No longer could he lift his feet high so he couldn't march with the rest of the troops. Neither king nor armed men could help him. In the great mountain, crowded together like a dust cloud over the ground, they said, let the men bring him back to Uruk. But they did not know how they could bring him. As his teeth chattered in the cold places of the mountains, they brought him to a warm place there. And so he comes down with this sickness. It's an unnamed sickness, but obviously he has a fever and he's having some convulsions with the fever and he's very sick. The story goes on to say that they make him a storehouse. They leave him in a cave and they make a storehouse so that he, he doesn't starve to death. They leave dates and figs and various sorts of cheese. They put sweetmeats suitable for the sick to eat in baskets of dates. They made him a home. They set out for him the various fats of the cow pen. The sheep folds fresh cheese, butter, as if laying a table for a funeral. Directly in front of the table they arranged for him beer for drinking, mixed with date syrup and rolls, placed stores of food and drink by his head in the mountain cave. They pushed into place at his head his axe. They wrapped up by his chest his dagger of iron. When they lifted his neck, there was no breath there any longer. His brothers, his friends, took counsel with one another. If a brother rises like Utu, the god of the sun, from bed, then the god who has smitten him will step aside, and when he eats this food, when he drinks this, will make his feet steady. May he bring him over the high places of the mountain to brick-built a rook. But if Utu calls our brother to the holy place, in other words, if Lugobanda dies, the valued place, the hereafter, the health of his limbs will leave him. Then it will be up to us when we come back from the city of Arata to bring our brother's body to brick-build a rook. So they're not sure if he's going to rise from his bed or not. They leave him there thinking that if he ends up dying, we'll just pick up his body on the way back. And so they left him behind. His brothers and friends abandoned holy Lugobanda in the mountain cave. And with repeated tears and moaning, with tears, with lamentation, with grief and weeping, Lugobanda's older brothers set off into the mountains. Then two days passed during which Lugobanda was ill. To these days, half a day was added. And at this point, Lugobanda lifts his eyes to heaven, to Utu. He wept to him as if to his own father. In the mountain cave, he raised to him his fair hands. Utu, I greet you. Let me be ill no longer. Hero, Ningal's son, I greet you. Let me be ill no longer. Utu, you have let me come up into the mountains in the company of my brothers. In the mountain cave, the most dreadful spot on earth, let me be ill no longer. Here where there is no mother, there is no father, there is no acquaintance, no one whom I value. My mother is not here to say, oh, alas, my child. My brother is not here to say, alas, my brother. My mother's neighbor who enters our house is not here to weep over me. 
A lost dog is bad. A lost man is terrible. On the unknown way, at the edge of the mountains, Utu, I am a lost man, a man in an even more remote, terrible situation, afflicted with mockery. Let me be ill no longer. Let me not come to an end in the mountains like a weakling. Utu accepted his tears, and he sent down his divine encouragement to him in the mountain cave. And so Utu doesn't actually heal him, but he sends encouragement. You're going to live to see another day. Look, here comes the sun. You've lived another day. You're going to be fine, Lugobanda. When Lugobanda lifted his eyes upward to Inanna, he wept as if before his own father. In the mountain cave, he raised his fair hands. Inanna, if only this were my home, if only this were my city, if only this were a rook the city in which my mother bore me. May my limbs not perish in the mountains of the cypress trees. Anana accepted his tears. With power of life, she let him go to sleep, just like the sleeping Utu. Anana enveloped him with heart's joy, as if with a woolen garment. And so she doesn't really heal him either, but she gives him a good sleep. And as you know, scientists tell us that it's during sleep that we heal best. And we grow also as little children, not as adults, hopefully. Then Nana, the god of the moon, in his starry radiance illuminated for him the mountain cave. When Lugobanda raised his eyes to heaven, to Nana, he wept to him as if to his own father. In the mountain cave he raised to him his fair hands. King, whom one cannot reach in the distant sky, Nana, whom one cannot reach in the distant sky, King, who loves justice, who hates evil. Nana, who loves justice, who hates evil. Justice brings joy justly to your heart. A poplar, a great staff, forms a scepter for you. You who loosen the bonds of justice, who do not loosen the bonds of evil. Nana accepted his tears and gave him life, so Nana heals him. He bestowed on his feet the power to stand. As the sun rose up from the horizon, the god which had smitten him stepped aside, and so they believed that a god had actually caused this sickness, and he sees that the other gods are healing him, are helping him, are encouraging him, and so he's going to leave and allow Lugobanda to feel better. This god went out from him, went up and away from him. When he raised his eyes heavenward to Utu, Lugobanda wept to him as to his own father. In the mountain cave he raised to him his fair hands. Utu, shepherd of the land, father of the black-headed, when you go to sleep, the people go to sleep with you. When you rise, the people rise with you. Utu, without you, no net is stretched out for a bird. No slave is taken away captive. To him who walks alone, you are his brotherly companion. Utu, you are the third of them who travel in pairs. Your sunshine clothes the poor and the scoundrel. As a garment of white wool, it covers the bodies even of debt slaves. The old women praise your sunshine sweetly until their oldest days. I think that's a very interesting portrayal of the sun, that at night the sun goes to sleep. Utu goes to sleep at night, and so that's why there's no sun. <laughs> and it's interesting that he calls the sun the companion, the brotherly companion. No one ever walks alone because Utu is always there. Sunshine is always there. Holy Lugobanda came out from the mountain cave that night, in the evening, he set off, hurrying through the mountains, a wasteland in the moonlight. He was alone, and even to his sharp eyes, there was not a single person to be seen. With the provisions stocked in leather pails, provisions put in leather bags, Holy Lugobanda had carried the things from the mountain cave. He was alone, and even to his sharp eyes, there was not a single person to be seen. Sleep overcame him. So th this story ends with a cliffhanger. He's gotten better, but he is lost up in the mountains. He doesn't know where to find the army. And he wants to be reunited with them. He wants to be part of taking the city of Arata for the glory of Uruk. This next week you're going to be asked to choose to either read about the Epic of Gilgamesh or Lugobanda and the Anzu Bird. And so as we finish our time together today, I just want to go over some of the main characters in each of the stories. Remember that you don't have to read both of them. You only have to choose one of them to read this week. So in the Epic of Gilgamesh, the main character, of course, is Gilgamesh. He is portrayed as being physically perfect, but he's rash and energetic, and he's thoughtless when it comes to others. He's brave, but he's arrogant, and he is the king of Uruk. 
He's described as being two-thirds God and one-third human. And so he is putting a heavy burden on his people. He's making them build these brick walls, which is very physically intense. But then he draws away the young men from the work to come and play with him because he wants to be entertained. And they get into these wild, violent games, and they end up knocking down parts of the wall, and then he forces them to build it all back up. And so they are very upset with him. The next character that you need to know about is Enkidu. Uh, the people of Uruk have been praying to the gods, and the gods have heard them, and so they send Enkidu down to be a match for Gilgamesh, to put him in his place. Enkidu is considered to be a wild, hairy, adventurous man. He is a friend to Gilgamesh eventually, but he was created to be Gilgamesh's equal and to divert his attention away from mistreating the people of Uruk. Shamhat is a sly, cunning temple priestess. She's the one who is sent out to tame Enkidu and to bring him back to Uruk. Humbaba is a monster figure. He was created by the gods to protect their sacred grove of cedars. He ends up fighting both Gilgamesh and Enkidu, and in the end he loses. We also see the goddess Ishtar, and she, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, she's known as Ishtar. She, remember, is the goddess of love and war, and in this story she's portrayed as a cruel and vain goddess. She falls in love with Gilgamesh, but her love quickly turns to hatred, and she sends the Bull of Heaven to punish Gilgamesh. And finally, the last main character is Utnapishtim. He is the Noah character. He's old, he is immortal, he survived the worldwide flood, but he doesn't want eternal life. <laughs> he and his wife have gotten older and older and older. They don't have eternal youth, they just have eternal life. And so all of their friends and family have died, and they're very lonely, and they are very sympathetic characters. And quickly, the main characters in Mughalbanda and the Anzu Bird. Of course, Lugobanda is the main character. He's a soldier in the army of En Merker. He's left behind. We just read about that. And when he is healed, he wants to catch up with the troops. The next main character is the Anzo bird. He is a mythological bird that has the, um, I believe he was supposed to have the body of an eagle and the head of a lion. He is able to speak people's destinies. He's a very magical bird, and so... Lugobanda appeals to him for, for help to get out of the mountains and find the army. And Merker is also in the story. He's the king of, the, of Uruk. We've already discussed him. He built the temple for the goddess Inanna in the Kaluba district of Uruk. And then he leads his army against the king of Arata. In this story, we read about Inanna rather than Ishtar, same goddess, of course, the goddess of love and war. But in this story, she is portrayed as accompanying the troops of Enmerker to the city of Arata, but then she ends up abandoning them to return to her nice new temple back in the Kaluba district of the city of Uruk. Lugobanda volunteers to go back by himself to ask her why she's left, and you'll see what happens. And then finally, we have the brothers and companions. They are the soldiers from Uruk, specifically from the Kulaba district of the city, and the Kulaba district was famous for having a temple to Anu and another temple to Inanna, and so it was like a holy district of the city of Uruk. And that is the end of our presentation for today. Hopefully you'll enjoy reading either the Epic of Gilgamesh or the story of Lugobanda and the Anzu bird, and if you have any questions, you know that you can always shoot me an email.